Will do. Will do. My son will be proud. <laughs> well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the uh, first live stream from Space Oddities, who are these uh, wonderful people you can see on your screen. Uh, if you'd like to know more about these people, uh, we have prepared an introductory video, which you will find on the channel. Just want to say a bit about who we are and what we're all about. We all uh, have been working together for the past couple of years on Astro Radio, but uh, sadly that's now defunct. So we've come over here to find ourselves a new home on YouTube. What have we got lined up for you? We've got plenty of space news, discussion, all sorts of stuff, quizzes. Um, we are obviously finding our feet at the moment. So this will be a bit of an experiment for us, but we hope you'll stick with us and subscribe to our channel because we have got some plans for some great stuff, anything astronomy and space related. And thank you so much for being here. So I will turn to my illustrious uh, panel here and say, how is everybody? Fine, thank you. Fine, thank you. Fine, thank you. Exciting. Good, this is you. our first yeah. live view. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is yeah. quite yeah. exciting. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah, and it's nice that so many people have come to, to see us already. So uh, that's fantastic. This evening, we're going to go through some uh, news, uh, which, uh, you know, everybody's just bursting to tell you all the latest astronomy and, and space news. So if everybody's ready, are you ready, panel, to, to start? Yes? Ready when yes, you are. Yes, game. Okay. Right. Ready well, for Daz, I think you had a, a very interesting story about the, um, the uh, proximity to the first science run of the James Telescope that we're uh, at at the moment. Yes, well, after months and months and months, I'm sorry, may I just welcome all the viewers to uh, Space yes. Oddity. Um, and uh, basically, James Webb now, we've had months and months of it uh, getting everything ready, like a line in the mirrors, etc., um, and it's only about a week or 10 days or so from actually producing its first scientific images. Um, they won't be released until sort of like more uh, a month or so away. Um, but I thought we'd just like to talk about some of the actual targets that it's going to be looking at in its first uh, run, its first cycle, as they call it. Um, and a, a lot of them are looking at exoplanets. And there's two in particular that they're going to be looking at. They're going to be using NERI, which is Near Infrared Instrument, and MIRI, which is, uh, well, what is MIRI? MIRI is the Mid -in -infra uh, Infrared uh, Instrument, uh, to look at rocky planets. But these planets are um, two super Earths, um, which are two hot planet exoplanets. Um, and one is called 55 Cancer E. Um, and the airless LHS 3844B, it rolls off the tongue. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason they're looking at these two is they're, they're planets that are actually very close to their suns, or should I say their stars. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the Cancer B, they think is, so it's, um, let me just find, there's some information here. Uh, Cancer uh, 55 orbits less than 1.5 million miles from its sun-like star, which is 125th of the distance between Mercury and the sun. So it's very, very close. And very, um, very hot. And very hot, yeah. <laughs> um, it completes one circuit in less than 18 hours, um, with surface te temperatures far above the melting point of typical rock-forming minerals. Ouch. Um, the day side of the planet is thought to be covered in oceans of lava. Um, it also is thought to be tidily locked, which means that one side, it's like the moon, it, one, we always see the one side. So that one side is being tortured by uh, intense heat and radiation from the sun. Um, and... Basically, with um, when they look at it, they expect the near side to the of the um, planet to be the hottest. But using Spritzer, um, the NASA's Spritzer um, Space Telescope data, they realize that actually the hot point isn't completely on that side on that side of the face in the sun. Uh, it does move around apparently. Now, they reckon that there could be several reasons for this. Um, and one of them is that it could have a thick atmosphere, which is mostly um, co uh, oxygen or nitrogen, which is mixing up the temperatures and moving it around. So they can see this, these hot points moving around. Um, and uh, another one 
uh, reason they think it could be happening is that uh, rather than being tidally locked, it could be actually rotating, spinning, doing uh, as it orbits around the nice. its star. Um, again, of course, this will pull the hot side around and move everything about. But one of the most interesting things that they may they think and they're theorizing, of course, is that the temperature is so hot that it will actually vaporize the surface, the rock. And this rock will actually form an atmosphere. This vaporized rock will form an atmosphere above the planet. But as it rotates, if it is rotating, as it goes into the night side, of course, this vaporized rock will cool. It will then turn to lava and it will actually rain down back onto the surface um, and then re solidify when it reaches the the uh, the night side of it. So you imagine that it's sort of like <laughs> as the sun's setting, you're actually being rained on by hot lava. Yeah, it's not 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 an ideal holiday destination. Then. No, not at all. No, not at no. all. Um, and uh, the other uh, planet. Daz, before you move on, yes, sorry? isn't it incredible the resolution that Spitzer was able to get to be able to actually yes. see hot yeah. spots on this tiny planet light years away? I mean, it's just it it's it's remarkable. And James Webb is going to have better resolution, and so we're exactly going yeah. to be able to see. I, I think the figure is, uh, Kareem, that James Webb will have twenty eight times the resolution of Spitzer, exactly, which, yeah. which is going to be mind blowing. Yeah, of course, it's going to be the spectroscopy. Uh, oh, here we go. Spectroscopy. <laughs> the spectroscopy. Does. The, uh, the spectrographs on the, uh, the James Webb will also be looking at if it has an atmosphere, what this atmosphere is made of. Is it nitrogen? Is it oxygen? Or is it vaporized rock? Um, and also, they'll be using the spectrographs on another planet, which I mentioned, which is LHS 3844b. As I said, it just rolls off the tongue. Mm. Um, and this is actually a solid rock uh, exoplanet, again, close to its sun, uh, its, its star, which is smaller and cooler. Um, but so uh, this actually is a solid uh, planet rather than a molten planet. But again, using spectroscopy, they will be um, able to discern what the minerals are in the actual rock that is covering the planet. Um, and it's just one of those really wonderful special things. And this will go for, uh, help us to look for look at the uh, other exoplanets in our um, in our Milky in the Milky Way, um, especially. And it will tell us hopefully something about the history and how these planets have formed. Oh. Um, and as I said, it um, uh, it was this. This is one of the. This is just two of the. Uh, objects that are going to be looked at um, with uh, in this first cycle, and Super. if I if I remember rightly, there was over a thousand applications for these these projects, and only two hundred and sixty eight have been chosen for this first cycle. Right, um, but I think we must mention at least one of these studies. I mean, there's they, they cover such a wide range. Um, but one of them is led by Olivia Lim from the University of Montreal, um, who will be who will perform reconnaissance on all seven of the Trappist T planets, uh, pla Trappist wow. one's planets. And of course, we, we know that there is a link there to uh, Karim in Canada. Yeah, Karim, so tell, tell, us, tell us a link. We hosted her back in April for a public event, and she was amazing she talked all about the planetary uh, geology and what we believe is the way in which the seven different possibly rocky terrestrial planets were created but also the fact that several of them are in the habitable zone and so we're hoping that the spectroscopy reveals elements of maybe even biosignatures in the atmosphere so as we look at those exoplanets who knows if maybe something's looking back at us which would be just incredible but what's interesting is there's several projects on the TRAPPIST-1 system. Hers is one of those. So she's concentrating on several of the planets and other projects are on other planets, but her data is going to be publicly available right from the start. So any interested astronomers, astronomy enthusiasts can follow along with the research being done by the James Webb Space Telescope. So we'll have to have Olivia on as a, as a guest to Space Oddities at some point in the future. Yeah, that'd be great. That would yeah. be really fantastic. That would be amazing. And I think, uh, Lou, you had some news about the uh, the mirror alignments. Uh, isn't that correct? Yeah, I do. Uh, uh, of course, I 
I just want to note that I, I think it is absolutely stunning that we have any information yes. about exoplanets. <laughs> it's only been about 30 years or so that we've uh, had any uh, evidence that there are exoplanets. And you're, the two that you mentioned, Daz, are very close to their sun, and, and we're going to find many more of those, right, because uh, the primary detection method is the transit detection method, which favors planets near their star. So, um, but yes, so, so uh, James Webb has finally finished uh, aligning all 18 mirrors to their uh, four focal planes. And there's, so there are four instruments, right? There's the uh, near cam, near infrared camera, as, as, you, and, uh, as you were mentioning, uh, the, the near spec, near, spec uh, near infrared spectrometer, MIRI, the mid infrared uh, interferometer, and then a near infrared slitless spectrometer. And you have to align the mirrors just so, so that they can focus at the focal planes of all four instruments. And that has been achieved. So now they are ready for actual science imaging. Uh, they, we've, we've seen some beautiful images so far, uh, but they were kind of test subjects, kind of what you might call engineering images, mm. just to test out the uh, capabilities of, of the, uh, of the um, spacecraft. Uh, but now they're ready to go. And I, I guess June, is it uh, June we're going to start to see um, some actual science? Is that, does that yeah, fit with what you know, Dad? That's right. Yeah, they're looking towards June to actually produce the, uh, the first data um, uh, and then yeah. the science can really start. And then we'll be, uh, uh, we'll be away then. I mean, we've waited for this for so long. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's, I mean, we, we were really concerned because it launched on Christmas Day, if you remember. I was cooking the lunch at the time and everything stopped. Uh, I was yelling drunk at the other TV with a brown ale in my hand. So. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, uh, get up, was, get up. <laughs> it was a, it was a per perfect uh, launch. Uh, in fact, far better than anybody expected because mm -hmm. they were only expecting 10 years of the James Webb, but now they predict that maybe, just maybe, they might be able to squeeze 20 years out of it due to the fact that it saves so much. The launch was so perfect. It saved so much uh, fuel in uh, setting it on its course so it's absolutely absolutely, absolutely. and ta beautiful. talking of um talking of exoplanets i think keith you've got um an interesting idea that's been put forward about a gravity telescope uh to see details of exoplanets uh yes that's right uh as a lot of people know distortions in the space-time fabric of the universe uh, they're caused by gravitational fields of large masses and of course, uh, they can bend light like a lens. This is a prediction from Einstein's general relativity, and it's been proven because we can see objects in the distant and early universe which lie behind closer galactic clusters and their dark matter halos. Uh, but what if we could apply this principle to observing exoplanets? Uh, scientists at the uh, Macintosh Stanford University have come up with the concept of using the sun as a gravitational lens. And uh, we know that works because uh, back in 1919, uh, Arthur Eddington and a scientist by the name of Dyson actually showed that stars that were behind the sun, the light from them was lensed around the sun by its gravitational field. Anyway, mm. the whole idea is to uh, use the sun as a gravitational lens to observe fine detail in exoplanet surfaces and atmospheres, far greater than anything we could achieve with the telescopes we have now. However, it's only a concept because the Hubble-sized telescope you would need to do this uh, would have to be aligned with the sun and the target planet, uh, and the target planet, and it would have to be placed 550 astronomical units away. Now, Voyager 1 is currently just under 100 astronomical <laughs> units from the sun, and it took 45 years to get this far. <laughs> so... Just... I was going to say, well, wouldn't a gravity telescope need to be a long way away from the sun? As you know, is that long? <laughs> yeah, a long way. So we're talking about a mission time of 250 years if we started tomorrow. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, it may be a nice idea, but obviously not, not a practical one. <laughs> OK, so moving on. Uh, what else has been happening this week? I think, Michael, um, you wanted to say something about the Boeing Starliner. Yes, that's right. Um, well, uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome everybody um, and uh, also bring uh, everybody down to Earth for a few minutes. Um, the uh, Boeing uh, Starliner spacecraft uh, completed its uh, touchdown last week on Wednesday at the White Sands uh, missile, uh, 
White Sand Space Harbour in New Mexico. Um, now, this is um, uh, an important step forward for the commercial crew program for NASA. Mm. Uh, in fact, in that, uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, uh, one reason I'd like to mention is the fact that it's only the second time, I believe, that an American capsule, space capsule, has actually landed um, on land rather than on the ocean. Um, oh. uh, as, the, as the first uh, Starliner, Starliner test uh, mission landed uh, when it, um, on its mission a couple of years ago. Uh, but also it will mean uh, once it does become operational, and we hope it does, it will mean that uh, NASA will have two um, operational vehicles to um, get people from the Earth to the space station. Uh, without relying on uh, Russian uh, vehicles, uh, which are not flying at the moment anyway. No, that's um, right. So um, it'd be great to have redundancy in that respect, and um, you know, and of course reusability because the capsule can actually be reused again and again. Um, so we look forward to um, what's going to happen next. Um, there's going to be a um, uh, you know a bit of time yet before we can. Uh, you know, achieve a crude um, test. Um, but Daz, if you want to say something about that? Uh, yeah, I was just saying uh, congratulations to Boeing for actually having a successful mission. We know they've had a nightmare of a time, um, some of the issues of their own making. Um, but this, uh, I've, I've done one to pour water on the coals, but at the end of the day, uh, they did have some niggly little um problems but one of my main concerns is they did have problems with the valves again um mm. on the the uh, small end booster engines on the uh, service module um two of them failed one failed within a second and another failed within i think it was about 20 seconds but a third one a redundancy because it had built-in redundancy did take mm. over and, com and completed the task that um it was supposed to do um now my thinking of this is that because we've had the um, extreme um, valve <clears> issues uh, leading up to this uh, test flight um, it, it's whether or not they because because it's on the service module as well mm -hmm. they won't be able to inspect these mm -hmm. um, valves to see what if it was actually a valve problem or whether it was uh, could have been electrical or some communication between the the, 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 the thruster and the, the computer but because it's um, before the Orion, um, the Orion capture, uh, Starliner capsule comes back. Sorry, wrong capsule. Uh, the Starliner comes back. Um, the service module is ejected and it uh, basically mm. burns up in the atmosphere. But they can use telemetry to try and decide what's going mm. on. But also there isn't still on the table as they are talking that there may be a total redesign of the valves, mm. which I wonder where will that put this? Will we still have to then go back to doing tests? Yeah, and didn't wasn't this this particular service module was wasn't this one that brought forward from a later um, mission? Yeah, uh, so yeah, one of the, the crew missions, maybe. Um, yeah, because because the the original service module, if you remember, the thirteen of the propulsion valves. Uh, were found to be jammed hours before the, the first um, demonstration flight. So they, they, they couldn't find the solution to why the valves were, were jammed. They knew that, well, they, they highly suspected that water had got in there mixed with the, the fuel and uh, formed a corrosive acid, which had eaten away the valves and jammed them, but they never found out the exact cause. So, so what they decided to do was just swap out the service module and put another one in without solving the problem. And then again, we had the problems with the valves. But I've been reading this week that it's being suggested that NASA may ask Boeing to do another demo mission um, on the hope that this time everything will go perfectly because they will not, well, they shouldn't human certify the Starliner to carry people until, you know, all of these problems mm. have been ironed out. It's, it's a consistent <laughs> pattern with Boeing, these failures of different components. And every time they try something, it's something different. There was an additional problem with the docking adapter when they got to the space station. They deployed the docking adapter, which sort of comes forward from the nose of the Starliner. It didn't work properly. So they had to um, they had to put it back in again and try it again, and it worked the second time. There was a problem with one of the antennas on the way up as well. 
it's just a consistent pattern of failure with Boeing. Mm. And, um, and, you know, I, I personally, I think NASA would be crazy at this point to human certify it because those problems with the valves and the problem with the docking adapter, they could be extremely dangerous if there'd been people on board. Yeah, well, so, we do. We do, so, have, we do hope they resolve these problems, of course, but if you know, absolutely, only, only time will tell, of course. Absolutely. All right, moving on. Um, Keith, um, you were going to tell us something about the uh, the Kessler syndrome relating to uh, orbiting spacecraft, weren't you? Yes, uh, the Kessler syndrome, which is named after its proposer, is the assumption that collisions between space debris will increase exponentially until nearer space is impassable to spacecraft. To put it simply, we could be walling ourselves in. Uh, mm. Not helping the matter was the explosion recently, in early May, I think it was, of a Russian Soz Ullage rocket. Uh, it's thrown itself into a minimum of 16 fragments. Uh, 54 of these rockets have previously exploded in Earth orbit, and there are another 64 to go. Um, this one was left from the launch of a GLONASS uh, Russian uh, GPS satellite. Um, by the way, if anyone's wondering what a knowledge rocket is, uh, if you think about it, if you're in a free fall environment, uh, the fuel inside and the oxygen inside the tanks of a, a rocket uh, sloshes about pretty aimlessly. And so the knowledge rockets are fired initially when there's a stage, step, stage separation in order to uh, push the, uh, accelerate the, uh, the rocket stage, push the fuel to the back of the tanks, and then it flows into the engine and ignites. Uh, anyway, one of those has blown up because there's always a little bit of fuel left in them, you see, and they're pretty unstable things. There you go. <laughs> but, I mean, yeah. it's obviously a design fault that they they explode like that because, you know, we, we have plenty of spacecraft that have been in orbit for decades and, and don't explode. So, so well, um, I don't know what kind of fuel they've got, but I'll put my money on hydrazine as being a possibility. Yeah, um, hydrazine looks to be the... Uh, Looks to be the one. Yeah. So, no, Keith. One of my one of my first jobs out of out of college was working for a company called Wolf Research, who did uh, uh, geopotential modeling and orbit dynamics. Was to track a piece of space shrapnel from a rocket that blew up <laughs> and determine its orbit. Really? So, yeah. Yeah. It was, so it was fun. God, you've had a more exciting life than I have, Corinne. That sounds enormous fun. No, no, that was Lou. <laughs> that, was that was Lou. Lou. Oh, that was Lou. Sorry. Yeah, was Lou, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't looking at the Corinne screen. Corinne has had more exciting life than you too, though. Andy. Yeah, don't worry. Yeah, yeah that's, true. <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's <laughs> true. But actually, redirecting to Michael and Daz, uh, Kai in the chat wrote uh, that he's wondering about Boeing just rushing these programs too much. Is that the reason for the amount of uh, issues that they've been having? I uh, think... Um, I think uh, the reverse is true, to be quite honest, mm. because of these zero hours contracts that the big aerospace companies have got NASA by the short and curlies with. Mm. Uh, they, they try and play it out as long as they possibly can because they're under no obligation to perform within time or within budget because of the contracts. Because if they overrun with the contracts, the zero hour contracts specifically I'm talking about, the, UK, uh, the US taxpayer uh, picks up the bill. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but on the other hand, NASA have been getting very impatient with Boeing because of their consistent failures. So yes, it, it could well be that, yeah, that yeah. They're, they're hurrying things. You see, the, the problem is that, you know, Boeing is the main contractor, but then you've got hundreds and hundreds mm -hmm. of subcontractors off under them, all doing bits. And, um, and if the central management of those projects is not sort of absolutely spot on, you're going to get things like this happening. So I don't know. I don't know. Time will tell, really, on that one. Yeah. Michael, you got something to say? Yeah, I was just thinking back to the uh, Space Shuttle program. Uh, wasn't Boeing the main contractor? And the Space Shuttle was very late. Yeah. They, um, they, lots of different problems. Yeah, they um, with the uh, shuttle program, Boeing were the main contractor. Um, and, of course, um, I'm just trying to think of the name of... Uh, mm. The, yeah, solid yeah, rocket, boosters, the rocket, yeah, yeah the solid boosters. Um, uh, with, with Martin, the, Martin Firepool. Yeah, no. Martin, that's it. That's, that's them, the yeah. Um, but yes, in, in Boeing, um, were the main, uh, the main contractor, and uh, of course, then they subbed everything out. Um, so, and not only, not only with, um, with this Starliner, of course, it has flown 
once before and again that was a near catastrophe mm -hmm. so now they're under a lot of pressure to get this thing working again because we need a second um taxi to the iss yeah um because at the moment and also it's the the starliner is the only thing that with with um possibly the russians may be pulling out it's the only thing that will have enough oomph if the valves work on the, the booster rockets to push the gently push the ISS back up into right. a higher orbit. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is why they really do. They need really do need it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, let's. Say, um, so can, I say th can I say thank you to Kai for putting a comment in the chat and uh, to everybody who's actually yeah. writing in the chat on YouTube. We're enjoying it. A few of us are there answering your questions or giving, you know, Hints and advice, and uh, Mary's on there uh, joining us uh, as his cat. So it's oh, nice great! Oh, nice to see you too. Shame you couldn't have been with us tonight, but never mind. Hope to see you soon. Uh, yeah, thanks to everybody who's writing things in the comments. We are looking at them. So if you have any questions, anything you want to ask, anything you want to say, do pop them in the comments. We'll be, you know, very happy with that if you do. Moving on now to the um, fascinating subject of black holes. Keith, do you want to tell us about uh, this new discovery about the, the variety of uh, black holes in dwarf galaxies? Yes, I'll, I'll try to. It was a pretty uh, hard read, the paper that I read. But uh, basically, uh, we all know that now that uh, large galaxies, generally speaking, have a supermassive black hole in the middle. And they may have a mass of millions, even billions of solar masses. But uh, what about dwarf galaxies? Uh, do they have smaller black holes in the middle of those? Um, some with masses maybe as low as 50,000 solar masses. Uh, well, they prove hard to detect uh, using standard spectroscopic techniques. Um, dwarf galaxies with high rates of star formation, significant gas content and poor in metals, that's heavier elements, present particular difficulties. And I, I would imagine uh, it's basically, it's just so much background noise making it hard to pick out what's going on. But uh, by selecting different uh, elements in the spectral signatures, the number of black holes in dwarf galaxies, uh, hello, my screen's changed. <laughs> Excuse me a minute. Uh, yeah, uh, has been uh, re-estimated from under 1% uh, to somewhere in the order of three to 16%, which I must admit is a pretty wide margin, but it's still a lot more. Uh, this, of course, has implications for galaxy building models uh, where dwarf galaxies gravitationally merge to form larger ones. Um, this uh, information, by the way, came from the Astrophysical Journal on the 24th of May. Right, thank you very much. Yeah, sorry, sorry that, Keith, that was me. I was just uh, putting an image. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I suppose. Uh, but uh, <laughs> it does bring us on to the subject of black holes, and in particular, the famous one in uh, in the middle of M87, which is our first ever image of, of a black hole. Uh, and let me just show you this, because there's a, a new paper come out by a group of Japanese scientists that casts some doubt on the methodology used to produce the picture, the first ever picture of the black hole in the galaxy, M87. So let me just share this, and uh, hopefully we can we can see that. Uh, okay, so hang on one second. Can everybody see this picture now? Yeah. 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 Yep. Yep. Okay. This is the galaxy M87, and of course, back in I think it was 1918, around then, astronomers couldn't understand what they saw shooting out of it which is this massive jet coming from the center of the galaxy. It extends for 5,000 light years. Uh, so it's, you know, humongously long. And as you can imagine, to focus that jet over 5,000 light years requires a huge amount of energy, an unbelievable amount of energy. We now know that these jets, which are uh, in the parlance called relativistic jets, are ejected from their host galaxies by supermassive black holes. And here is M87, the first one really to, to, to be noted to have one of these jets, because it's so obvious. I mean, I think you'd agree with me that, you know, looking at this in the telescope, you can't miss it. It's probably its most distinguishing feature. It is a giant elliptical galaxy, the result of past galactic mergers. So it's just this sort of amorphous, um, enormous galaxy, far larger than the Milky Way. However, um, the, the interesting thing here was, of course, we saw the image, uh, which was this. This is the first ever black hole image, which, uh, you know, made front page news around the world. And 
it shows the um, not the event horizon in the middle, the, the dark area. Um, it's often reported as the event horizon. It isn't the event horizon. It's something called the black hole shadow, basically where there are no photons because all the photons are being deflected away by the black hole's gravity or they fall directly into the black hole if they go too close. So this is a sort of a no photon zone, if you like, and it's called the black hole shadow. It's not a real shadow, of course, because you need a solid object to cast a shadow and black holes aren't solid. It's an area where there are no photons, surrounded by this enormous disk of uh, plasma um, spinning around the black hole and eventually supposedly getting consumed by it. We're all familiar with this image, but the Japanese scientists have come up with an interesting paper. And they said, hang on a minute, um, we're not happy because we think this, this image, what could have been the result of selective bias. And what they mean by this is that the Event Horizon Telescope team had an idea of the mass of the black hole. They could therefore work out its gravity and they could wor therefore work out roughly how big that black hole shadow was going to be. And because they had that sort of preconception, which had shown up in all of their simulations, um, they chose the field of view for this image. You know, we right zoomed into the black hole uh, itself, uh, well, the, the shadow surrounded by the gas. And they, the Event Horizon scientists team chose the field of view. But the Japanese scientists now say, well, what, let's back up a bit. If you increase the field of view three times, you get this image and that ring structure disappears altogether and is replaced with these sort of two lobes of material which don't resemble the original image at all. In addition, if you look sort of at the four o'clock position, there's another object which they designated W for reasons I've no idea. Um, and they say, well, this is something else showing up there that wasn't in the original image. And um, they don't know what that is. But this is an image, as it says at the top, from the first two days of the Event Horizon Telescope's observations in 2017. The remaining days show a very similar picture. So they're saying, look, if you zoom out and look at it from a bit further away, what was in the original image put forward by the Event Horizon Telescope as being the black hole with its orbiting disk, disappears. And furthermore, if you zoom out even further, you will see that it looks very different. Now, one thing the Japanese scientists say is that in the EHT image, there should have been a sign of that jet and there wasn't, and that worried them. But when you zoom out using their methods of analyzing the data, the jet becomes apparent, as you can see in this image. And the inset there is from the very large array, the, the huge radio telescope in New Mexico. That's a radio image of the jet. Um, and here you see it's very neatly paralleled by the, uh, the image that the Japanese scientists came up with when you zoom out and look at the bigger picture, as it were. So it's all very, very interesting. Um, in the same week, another paper has been prepared by a bunch of PhD uh, graduates to recreate the Event Horizon Telescope team's image. Because as you know, in science, if you can't reproduce something, you're not doing science. It isn't science. Science has to be reproducible by other people. They found it very difficult to do so because the Event Horizon Telescope team apparently don't want to release their computer code scripts that they use to, to create the image uh, for whatever reason. Um, so they had to take a guess at what the methodology used was uh, for a lot of things. But the point is, they came up with almost identical images to what the Event Horizon Telescope team did. So who's right? Who's wrong? We don't know. And obviously, uh, all eyes are, are now on the same Japanese team who are going to analyze the more recent image of the Milky Way uh, black hole, Sagittarius A star, to see what they get from that. And if they get the same sort of discrepancy from that, I think there'll be some very interesting questions asked. So is it so a discrepancy? Because it's different scales of, of view, right? And this happens it is. any object that you look at is as you go in for more resolution, you'll see details that you cannot see on the larger view. Well, this, this, is, this is precisely what the Event Horizon Telescope team have come back with. They've said, look, if you zoom out, you can, get, you can make it anything. You know, uh, it really does depend on your point of view. But the Japanese team are insisting that there's something wrong 
with the fact that in their images they don't see this ring structure at all uh, and they, they haven't gone they uh, have they tried to use the data to reproduce at that same scale to see if they get the ring structure uh as far as i know they haven't because they haven't been able to get hold of the data um ah, okay they haven't been able to uh, you know the same thing the event horizon telescope team are keeping their methodology very close to their chests for presumably proprietary reasons um you know uh, uh, perhaps they don't want other people uh, messing with their code and you know uh coming up with things that might not be correct. i don't know i don't know but they haven't been able to reproduce it using the same methods because uh the the ehc team won't release the the code it is um, promising that the other team of uh, of uh, researchers was able to reproduce some sort of a ring structure though that's right that is promising yeah. but <laughs> but it's quite but you know as eht said look if you view out from from a cow you know you can make it uh, you can make it uh, one shape and you view out even further and you you can see another shape and so on uh, yes daz um you were talking about cognitive bias if I understand correctly, in the first image of M87, um, didn't they use four separate teams to produce an image uh, using the data and their, their own techniques? Yes, they did. Without even knowledge that the other teams existed. Yes. And, they, they when they came, yes, and when they came to the end, all the images were very, very similar. Um, so it ruled out uh, cognitive bias because none of the other teams knew of the other's existences. And when they all came together, it was all the same. Yeah, absolutely um, true. So absolutely you know, true. I don't know. It's, um, it's an interesting story and we'll just have to wait and see who's correct. Yeah, it is. It is. It's, it's an interesting, um, interesting uh, spin on it, if you like, but uh, you know, the, 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 I, I, I couldn't understand the paper. It's highly technical. So, um, so Andy, uh, yeah. City Space Astro is asking if the image uh, with the larger field of view is showing two black holes, or is it just that the structures are too close for us to determine if it's two black holes or the polarity of two black holes or what um, would be causing it? Nobody knows at the moment. Even the Japanese team say we don't know what this is. And the fact that there's a third object there that was labeled W uh you know is is uh also interesting but they think that may be some sort of artifact from the processing um but they you know their image looks like there's a, a double load structure and there have been suggestions in recent uh last couple of years that there are in fact two black holes at the center of our galaxy uh two supermassive black holes and not yeah. just one so it's also um, the case that with m87 when you look at the jet structure you see a lot of hot points right near where the massive super supermassive uh, galactic black hole would be absolutely um, absolutely yeah yeah so it's it's all interesting stuff but you know time will tell basically Excellent. right so moving on um so we've got this thing um, about um, about the distribution of these these dwarf galaxies. Keith, did you want to say anything about that black holes in the in the dwarf galaxies? Uh, not a lot more, to be honest. Right. Uh, okay. Yeah, that was it. That was it. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Okay. So, uh, what else have we got to chat about then, guys? Let's have a look. Um... Amber, right. Amber is asking in the chat about if black holes have any influence on planetary systems, either close to or far away, even the case of our solar system compared to the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. Does anybody want to talk about gravitational influence and how far it spreads? Well, all I can tell you is just for fun, I calculated the strength of gravity on our planet from the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. And it came out as 0 0.000000000057 newtons. Uh, that's how much gravitational influence. Uh, th that should have been 13 zeros, by the way. I might not have counted that correctly, but it came out as 0 0.13057 newtons, if my math is to be believed. So um, <laughs> to answer Amber's question, um, from where we are, 26,000 light years away from the galactic center, and you've got to remember that's 26,000 times 6 trillion miles from the galactic center, the black hole doesn't have, well, has that effect, 0 0.13057 newtons, so no. About 100 stars do orbit the black hole at the center of our galaxy, um, and obviously its gravitational influence would be much stronger there. 
the, um, the, the star that comes the closest is called S2, and it comes uh, within about 80 astronomical units of the black hole. At, at one astronomical unit is the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Um, and you'd expect that to have some influence, but, but essentially no. Um, it however, is it sorry, is interesting to note that we can't actually look at planetary systems for the stars that are close to the no, we can't. our black hole uh, for no. our galaxy, because you can't look visually or even through infrared into that area because there's yeah. just too much of the arms of the Milky Way blocking our view of that center. So yeah. all you can do is you can infer by looking at the motion of the stars, what might be happening, mm. but the wobble that might happen from exoplanets can't be detected because the, the speed of those stars orbiting the black hole is actually quite fast. Well, the S2 at its closest approach is going at 11 million miles an hour. So uh, that is, you know, incredibly fast. Although there's another star that I was reading about the other day that's just set a new record they found. This is S62 orbiting um, the same black hole that was going something like 40 million miles an hour, if I remember rightly. Um, so interestingly. Um, let's, let's come back closer to home now, Lou, because you had some news about Voyager, didn't you? Ah, the Voyager space mission, yes. Um... Uh, best best bang for the buck that we uh, ever had. This, these <laughs> things were launched in 1977. They're still working outside the heliopause, outside the protective um, uh, charged particle sphere of the of the sun. And uh, Voyager One, uh, by many accounts, is functioning quite normally, which is uh, re remarkable in itself. After so many yeah. years, we're, right? We're approaching close to 50 years in space. But, but the uh, Attitude Art Articulation and Control System, we'll just call it the AACS, uh, which is the system that uh, uh, helps the spacecraft orient, helps mm. it point it, right? It's sending back some anomalous data. And uh, everything else seems to be working fine. All the other subsystems seem to be working fine. And what's odd about this is that if the, um, if the spacecraft was not oriented correctly, the dish would not be pointed straight at Earth, which is where they want it to get the maximum signal strength, right? But it appears that that's the case. The signal strength has not uh, varied. Uh, I mean, it varies over slightly over time as the spacecraft gets further away, but nothing uh, in the near term. So uh, that plus the fact that there are um, uh, there are no onboard faults. There are no safe safe mode triggers. They don't know what this is. So they're um, the engineers are working the working the problem. There is an engineering model of the Voyager spacecraft out at Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, so they can use that uh, to some extent to try to model what might be happening with the uh, Voyager that's uh, actually got launched. But as of now, they don't know. Oh. So a curiosity, an oddity, if you will. Mm. Mm. Lou, how much um, how much longer will the nuclear um, power uh, pack um, go for? Do you know? Right, right. The plutonium two thirty eight source. Mm. Um, uh, there is some hope. There is some hope that by cycling instruments on and off, so that you don't have everything running at once, you're just being very miserly about how you use power. There is some hope that they can actually keep these things functioning and sending back data till uh, 2027, which would be the 50th anniversary. Yeah. So yeah. We, we, we will see, we will see. But it, there, it's, uh, it's close to uh, the um, uh, end of its useful power, but uh, not quite yet. 50 years, fantastic. Mm. It'd be wonderful if you could make that, that'd be fantastic. But you know, I mean, Lou, it, I, I don't know if you find this, but I find one of the hardest things these days is to try to explain to students how little power the Voyager uses because I used to use, you know, the light bulb inside your oven, but nobody right. has that anymore. Now they have LED screens. <laughs> Wonderful. You still have one in your refrigerator, right? Yes, mm. exactly. But it, it's it's mm. incredible how little power it uses. Uh, there yeah. is a question in the chat for you, Lou. Uh, somebody's asking if there's theories about what could be causing this uh, anomaly in uh, orientation for Voyager. They they don't have any theories yet. Of course, the, the Voyager is out in interstellar space, so there is some cosmic ray. Uh, uh, exposure. So there could be some single event problems with uh, some particle hits on the, um, the AACS, but as of right now, they just don't know. 
And that's what's that's is, isn't that what's so exciting about that's science? Right, yeah. yeah. It's, it's not the case that it's Sorry, not the case that somebody took the golden disc and it's rebalanced it. <laughs> <laughs> Marvel, now, Marvel. now we're gonna now we're gonna hear about it now we're gonna hear yeah. about it Kareem. sorry yeah. i had to yeah go on case andy's behaving himself somebody has to do this <laughs> go on case oh i was just going to add the radio thermal generators that are used in spacecraft to go into deeper space uh the concept was uh first devised by uh, robert goddard the american rocket pilot really it was sadly, sadly overlooked uh, in favor of Werner von Braun, as you know. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But isn't this just the sort of behavior from an aging spacecraft? Same, you get with an old person going a bit cranky in their old age. Mm. Um, well, you have to be careful. You have to be careful. So we, we might say that about people. You go to your doctor, you say, oh, this hurts. Well, you're getting old. Or maybe you, you know, didn't do something right or eating the wrong foods or whatever. Mm. Um, the, the, the challenge is to actually find out what it is. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Well, yeah. You know, it, Steve, it happened rather suddenly. Yeah. Steve, go on. Well, I might be wrong about this, but I have a feeling the only reason they've managed to uh, extend the life of Voyager is they re reinvented the original programming to reprogram and close some of the systems, the unnecessary systems down on board the spacecraft to, to utilize uh, more efficient energy usage. But because I think the original program programming, had, had, had got lost or uh, the knowledge of it had got lost. And so they completely uh, restarted and managed to pull it off, which I think is remarkable. It is, isn't it? It, it, from that distance, what they've been able to do with both those spacecraft, the Voyagers has been absolutely stunning. Absolutely. And not just with the Voyagers. Uh, over that fifty-year no, no. period, well, over that fifty-year period, there have been uh, adjustments and modifications made to the deep space network. A yeah. few large uh, radio telescopes uh, situated around the planet that allow us to communicate with our deep space missions, especially with the with the Galileo mission. You might remember that the mm. um, antenna was um, uh, folded up like an umbrella and didn't unfold correctly. So they had to use data, new data compression algorithms. They had to increase the sensitivity of the deep space network in order to help that out. So a lot of modifications, both on the spacecraft and on the ground, have helped this mission continue. And we should, of course, mention that a lot of that sort of stuff finds its way into public use eventually. Uh, the, the, the new technology that's developed to solve problems like this, new, new data compression right. technologies, and you know, which everybody uses every day now. So um, absolutely unbelievable. Now, slightly closer to home, Lou, uh, tell us a bit about Dragonfly. Oh, this is a mission, you know, near and dear to my heart after spending so many years uh, studying the atmosphere of Titan. Dragonfly is a mission that was recently approved for funding. It is going to fly to Saturn's largest moon, Titan. And from there, it will drop a helicopter a drone onto the surface of Titan. I mean, think about this now. We're at what, a billion, uh, over a billion kilometers away, and you're going to pinpoint a <laughs> landing of a drone on the surface of Titan. And this drone will fly around, sense the atmosphere. It will have a plutonium power source, right? Because you're out far from the sun, and besides that, you have a, an obscuring atmosphere, so not a lot of sunlight gets through. And uh, it will, it has a mass spectrometer on board that will uh, tell us what the surface is made of, what the atmosphere is made of, it has some other instruments. Absolutely phenomenal mission. And I believe it launches in 2027 is what I remember. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, pretty exciting. How long is it gonna take to get there? Uh, I don't remember, let's see. It's, um, I know it's a lot slower than Voyager. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, let's see, uh, Voyager made it, uh, 77 to 81, to 81 or so is four years. So, um, uh, it's probably some, somewhere around a decade or so. Cause I think Cassini did it, uh, it was launched in 96 and got there in 2004, didn't it? So that was mm -hmm. right. about eight, eight and a half years, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, well, let's hope we live long enough to see it. Yeah, because um, yes. the, the, the <laughs> this dragonfly is going to be uh, a lot larger than uh, Ingenuity on Mars, of course. Um, with uh, 
blades, you know, slightly smaller compared to its size, for the simple reason that uh, the atmosphere is going to be a lot thicker than it is on uh, Mars. Yeah, and right. just to mention ingenuity, it was only supposed to last five flights. It's just com uh, completed its 25th. So well yeah. done. Well done. Round of applause to little ingenuity. But it, but it, yeah, well done. Indeed so. Um, but, uh, you know, Dragonfly is going to be about the size of a car, isn't it? It's quite yeah. a big... When we think of a drone, we think of those little ones we buy in the shops. Uh, mm. This is this is the, the sort of getting towards car size. Uh, so so isn't, isn't a parasaur uh, similar to what's on Perseverance? You know, that type of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, I think the wonderful next step after Dragonfly will be a submarine on Titan. Oh wow! And uh, yeah. I know uh, there or Europa. Or Europa. Or Europa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. Closer. Half the distance, twice, <laughs> twice the fun. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, uh, and uh, Enceladus, of course. Let's not forget Enceladus. Mm. Um, I would love to be um, a spelunker climbing down inside the tiger stripes on Enceladus. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Because, the, uh, you know, that, that ocean isn't, isn't, they think, it's not actually that deep under the tiger stripes and could conceivably be reachable. Wouldn't that be fantastic? We've talked before about the uh, recently released planetary decadal survey saying what planetary science should focus on for the next 10 years and an Enceladus uh, orbiter. Um, I'm not sure if it lander as well, but has been put as a high priority. Yeah. But let's just ask the question and perhaps how this uh, viewers can, can uh, answer this in the comments. If you, if you had unlimited budget to go to one planet in the next uh, decade or so, uh, which one would it be and why? Um, so let, let's go around. What, uh, let's let's start f uh, at my top, Michael. What would yours be? Where would you where do you want to go? Oh, oh, that's that's a good question, really. Um, I really like Titan um, because of the atmosphere uh, and the fact that um, the Huygens probe um, got there first. And um, I'd, I'd, I'd like to see a follow on to that. Right, Lou. You stole my thunder. I mean, I've been in this thing for, for, for a couple of decades and would love to be able to be there and see it in person. And I imagine even seeing through the rather thick uh, photochemical haze that uh, the bright, bright Saturn would look amazing from the surface. Of Can you imagine? I've seen paintings of that and you could just yeah. imagine yourself being there and, oh, my God, it would be amazing. Absolutely amazing. What about you, Daz? Where do you want to go? Um... Enceladus or Europa? Um, um, that's what I, that's where I'd like to go. I want to get into these oceans, and uh, I mean, Lou's done the uh, the aqualung diving, so uh, we'll send him <laughs> up there, uh, do his Jacques Cousteau bit, and uh, right. come back with all these new discoveries of creatures, big and small. That's what I would like to see. Um, Fantastic. Anything going out to the ice giants? Oh, right. Yes, get but out. You're there. there. You're there. there. Yeah. I've just noticed in the uh, chat on. Facebook, Frank, who used to be on our panel. Uh, oh, Frank's there, is he? Frank. Hi, Frank. Yeah, welcome, Frank. And well, welcome, Frank. Perhaps you can come and join us one night. Come yeah. and be on the panel. And he's still looking forward to balloons in the atmosphere of Venus. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, well done, Nice Frank. to see you, Frank. Thanks for, thanks for popping in. Um, Rachel, where do you want to go? I think Enceladus or Titan, but I was just saying to Karim in the chat earlier, I don't think we give our own planet enough credit. I think, you know, we're looking at all these rocks elsewhere, but actually, can you imagine being somewhere else looking at us and everything we've created on our own little sphere? And I think actually we don't take enough credit for our own planet, but Enceladus or Titan for me. Right. OK, Dave? Well, I'm with uh, with Ken. I, I'm, I'm torn between Venus and Titan, I'd love to see if you could surf on the uh, the the the, uh, the seas of uh, Titan, although it would be very calm, I should imagine, uh, or catch penguins as as they rain down with the sulfuric acid of Venus. But, uh, <laughs> but there we go. We'll never find out. <laughs> do, do, do you want to know the bad news about Titan, Dave? Do uh, please, yeah. Well, it's always been assumed that those enormous lakes, if you can call them that, or seas, if you want to call them that, on Titan, had waves. And they've discovered, actually, because of the nature of the methane and ethane and petrochemicals, the, the tallest waves on those lakes uh, cannot exceed one millimetre in height. So, <laughs> in that case, Andy, <laughs> penguins <certain>. it is. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Where are you, Keith? Uh, 
I uh, I would like to go to Uranus. Uh, I, apart from the fact that you know Voyager two swept past and we only got a limited view of it and its moons. Uh, the moons themselves are intriguing because I think they show similar characteristics to Enceladus and other active moons we see in the solar system. So there's a lot there to be discovered. And why is Miranda, for example, one of the smaller moons, got a patchwork quilt surface? Oh, and, why, God, yeah. and, why, and why has Umbriel got a completely, what appears to be an uh, inert surface covered in dark material, except for one large impact crater at the north end of the moon, um, compared to the more active fissured surfaces we see on the other of the three so yeah. uh yeah interesting the death interesting. star the death yeah. star what about steve well i was going to say exactly that same thing i think europa and enceladus in terms of search for life but i think generally some of the moons um a tour of the moons to discover why some of them are so tortured mm -hmm. in their surfaces gouged uh crazed uh, scraped uh, to to reveal some of the planetary processes that must have happened um, to, to create them and knock them into shape exactly as uh, Keith has just said, but also mm. we discover where they actually came from because the chances are they're probably captured uh, or quite likely captured rather than necessarily forming in, in planetary orbit in the first place. So sure, sure. Um, I'm sitting yeah. on the fence there, I right know. Well, they think Miranda has actually been broken up and reformed several times, hence it's rather bizarre terrain uh, that it's sort of been impacted hard enough to break apart but it's been pulled back together by its own gravity in a slightly different order um so you know like like a jigsaw puzzle gone wrong uh which is absolutely fascinating and of course you've got the solar system's tallest cliffs on miranda uh which uh vertical walls of sheer ice that are how many miles high was it 11 miles high something like that 12 miles high and it would take you uh, nearly 40 seconds if you jumped off because of the low gravity it'd take you nearly 40 seconds to get to the bottom um so so, is that miranda you're talking about yeah Sorry. yeah yeah, yeah uh, i worked it out it's 12 minutes that's 12 minutes is it oh my yeah. god <laughs> and you'll still die at the bottom because if you think about it you won't reach terminal velocity there's no atmosphere no that's right that's right uh, you'll, you'll just, just keep going die. faster and faster yeah yeah <laughs> Um, and um, for, sorry for interrupting. It looks like there's a Gale's trip getting there erased off to Enceladus. Uh, what, what, really? What the yeah. Well, let me Rachel sorry, and I'm... Kath, are, they're organising it in the background. What are we going? To, where are we going to go? Is the lads? The lads nice out? Oh. Mm. <laughs> mm. Triton. Triton's good. Triton. Is that the name of the club? Yeah. Yeah. Lots, uh, lots of that... atmosphere. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's full of old like it's that. full of old geezers. <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey. 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 He's got his joke in. Hey. <laughs> Come on, I haven't made one so far. Okay, uh, Roger, I think we're, we're your last but not least. I'd probably go to go to tr uh, Titan as well, just to see. But I'd perhaps go to Pluto. That's ah, a planet. Yeah, yeah. And maybe be able to see if there's any observable further planets like Planet X. Right. If there's any further <laughs> further discoveries of any other objects that haven't yet been discovered yet. Yeah. And um and Lou, you, you wanted to say something about New Horizons, I think. Uh, new Horizons, yeah. Well, uh, not exactly new news, but no, no. Uh, back in uh, nice 2020, news. <laughs> uh, yeah, back in April 18th of 2021, New Horizons oh. passed 50 AU from the sun, 50 times the distance from Earth to sun, and so that was a uh, a big momentous occasion. But the real momentous occasion will be when we have yet a third spacecraft in interstellar space. Uh, so New Horizons is predicted to cross the heliopause, the boundary between the sun's influence and interstellar space, somewhere in the 2040s. And that depends a little on the shape of the heliopause, which we don't think is uh, perfectly spherical. Um, but that will be an exciting time if we're still, especially if we're uh, still communicating with it. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and the thing about New Horizons is, I mean, it, that was on an exceptionally fast trajectory to Pluto, wasn't it? Um, and, um, and so, you know, if, if they can do a New Horizons, they can get to Saturn quicker with Dragonfly, I'm sure. 
So, uh, so let, let's wait and see. Right, well, I think, uh, ladies and gentlemen, our time is just, just about up here. So obviously, we'd like to thank you, the viewers, for tuning in tonight. We will, of course, hope to be back uh, same time here next Monday, where we'll have some more things to discuss for you. We hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, you know, this was a bit of an experiment for us tonight. Uh, to, this is our new home on YouTube. So we hope you've enjoyed it. And we also hope you'll like and subscribe to the channel. Uh, your subscriptions are like, would be much appreciated to help us get off the ground. So uh, if you haven't done that, we'd be really grateful if you could do that. And uh, I think it just leaves uh, so for the panel to say goodbye. And thanks very much for being here. And we'll see Thank you next you week. Much. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Bye. Bye. Keep Bye. those texts you coming see? in with those yeah. questions as well, please. Keep the questions coming in. Uh, keep the likes coming in. Tell your friends. Oh, yes. Like it, us. Like us. <laughs> yeah. Like us. Like us. Please. <laughs> please like us. We're, like. we're, very we're like so you. insecure. We really want to be liked. That's right. We are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and uh, you know, tell your friends, even if they don't like anything to do with space, drag them in anyway. The yeah. more, the merrier. Okay, folks. Thanks very much for being here. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Right, that's